Okay, so first off, uh, does anybody have any questions about any upcoming assignments? You said uh, we could pick like, anything that we've read for the exploratory? Um, yeah, starting with Plato, right? Yeah, right. right. So yeah, any, anything from Plato up to the Amy Tan essay we're going to talk about today, you can use okay. as the subject for your reflection. And remember, too, that next week we're going back to the rhetoric textbook, right? So bring writing analytically, don't bring reading the world to class with you. What were you going to say, Rachel? So, do we, so it has to be, we have to write about the implied, like, what, whatever quote we yeah. pick, it has to be, like, we pick something that's implied. In it. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so what you're doing is you're picking a quote that represents, like, one of these implied patterns we've been picking out, right? Um, so what, you know, one of these binaries or one of these strands that is implied in the text rather than explicitly stated, right? And you're going to try to work your way towards a kind of working thesis statement by the end of this reflection, right? So in the last paragraph, what I want you to tell me is what you think this particular strand or binary means in the text, right? What's it doing there? And then that'll, that'll provide a basis for paper one, which we'll start working on next week. So can we use other quotes that are related to that, like he sustained? Um, you know, I would say, yes, like get that set of quotes together because you'll need that for the longer paper. But I want for this just the one quote that you think is the best example of the thing you're talking about, right? Oh, okay. So yeah, try to stick to one quote for your analysis for, uh, for Tuesday. Any other questions? Nope. Everybody good? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so everybody's got this, right, so I can erase it? Okay, just because this is a much smaller board than we're used to, so board space is at a premium right now. I can't just go back and forth writing as much as I want to, wherever I want to. All right, so let's talk about the Amy Tan essay. What did you guys think of this? How did it go for you? I thought it was very interesting. Okay. How yeah. so? What, what interested you, uh, Grace? Um, Oops. Just hearing it from someone else's perspective, how language is so different. And, like, I can only speak one language, so, like, Okay. I mean, I have two years in Spanish, but sure. <laughs> like how language differs from like what is actually implied. Okay. It's yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. So a lot of what she's talking about. Yeah. If you can find an example of what you're there, talking I about. I circled the quote she wrote. It okay. Was really interesting. Good. Yeah. Take us there. Okay. She said, I can illustrate why word-for-word -word translation is not enough to translate meaning and intent. Uh-huh. Yeah, Spare, Sapir was right about differences between two languages and their realities. Right. I can illustrate why word-for-word -word translation is not enough to translate meaning and intent. So, like, uh -huh. translating a different language doesn't actually show us, like what was implied and what was the meaning of it. Sure. I um, that was very interesting. Yeah, let's, uh, let's stick with this thing. Right? Like, can somebody read for us the excerpt here from the letter? What? Um, just below this. It starts in 1925, I met my mother in Shanghai. Uh, in 1925... I met my mother in Shanghai. When she came to me, I didn't have greeting to her as if seeing nothing. She pulled me to a corner secretly and asked me why I didn't have greeting to her. I couldn't control myself and cried, Ma, why did you leave us? People told me, one day you ate a bean cake yourself. Your sister-in-law found it and sweared at you, called your name. So, is it true? She clasped my hand and answered immediately, it's not true. Don't say what like this. After this time, there was a few chance to meet her. Okay, so I think there are two things that are important here that this letter points out, right? So first off, 
if you do a one for one, like word for word literal translation from one language to another, how much sense does it make? Not, not really. Yeah, like we can get the gist of this, it's right? Not but yeah, but but uh, yeah, it, it, it's 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 not like like there. It's clear that there aren't direct Chinese equivalents for certain English words or direct English equivalents for certain Chinese words, right? And sometimes like the way the word the word is structured in one language is not the way it's structured in, in another, right? So for example, when um, you know the letter says did not have greeting for her, what does that mean? Yeah, didn't say hello, right? So have greeting for seems to be the Chinese equivalent of hello, right? But what else is illustrated by this story? What do her friends all misunderstand about it? The bean cake. About the eating the bean cake. Yeah, the story of the bean cake, right? And why don't they understand this? <laughs> what do they think? I mean, there's no real other context other than you ate the bean cake. It seems to be something that's more about the Chinese, like, you know, like uh -huh. something that they're, that's more of their culture than ours. So, I mean, like, I, I've never even seen a bean cake. Okay, so, so yeah, so, so on, on the one hand, but we, but we can still grasp what a bean cake must be, right? You know, that it's, it's, it's a dessert, right? Yeah. yeah. So, what they're saying in the letter is that she ate a whole bean cake herself, right? Okay. So what does that sound like she did? Something selfish? Yeah, she that she just, it. yeah, she selfishly ate a whole bean cake by herself, right? Mm -hmm. And her American friends, uh, Amy Tan's American friends, like, well, what was wrong with that, right? Yeah. And what do they not understand? Does the bean cake actually, is the bean cake actually a bean cake? No, it's supposed to be symbolic of this. Yeah, or the bean. The yeah, the bean cake's a metaphor. Exactly. The bean cake is a metaphor for this complex sexual situation, right? In which the boy, the, the the man who wrote the letter, right? His mother, who came from a respectable family, married as a number three concubine into another family. So, does everybody understand what a concubine is? It's like, um, <laughs> uh, like a, a side piece, if you will. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, a, like another... Would it be like a Mormon type thing, where they have like numerous like polygamy type deals? It's kind of in between those two things, right? So, a concubine <laughs> isn't quite a wife and isn't quite a mistress, right? Okay but is still kind of officially attached to, um, to a man, right? So it, it, it's, it's sort of like in um, certain polygamous societies, um, you know, there is you know, this, this form of marriage um, that is, you know, not considered quite as prestigious or official as other forms of marriage, right? You have, so, like, you're, like, main squeeze, and then, like... Yeah, the, 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 there, there, there would be, like, a primary wife and then yeah, a number of like concubines, right? Wife. Yeah, okay. yeah, and the fact that she's number three also means that she's relatively low down the totem pole there, right? So what she's done is brought shame on the family, right? Right. She's reduced the family status in the eyes of others, and that's what the whole story about eating the bean cake is concerned with, right? Now, there's a binary implied here that Tan is going to work with a lot throughout this piece between the literal and the figurative. And I want you to um, think about this in terms of your own language learning experiences for a moment, right? Um, do any of you speak another language fluently? I will take your silence to be no. <laughs> Sorry, no. <laughs> okay. But you've all had to take some language classes as students, right? Yes, sir. What languages have you guys taken? What, 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 what languages have you guys studied? Spanish. Everybody Spanish? Okay, it is, yeah, it, it's really all we offer here. Um, because, of course, it's all we offer here. 
<laughs> well, it's like how you get into a university in high school. You have to take two years of Spanish. Spanish. Is that language, a good? Well, is is that a, school only offering Spanish? So. Okay, yes. Yeah, so, so a lot of high schools are also only offering Spanish. Right. Okay. A lot of them do French too, but yeah. Yeah, my, my, my high school offered uh, offered Spanish and German. Um, so I, I, I took uh, I ended up taking a total of about five years of German between high school and college. Wow. Um, I don't remember much of it because I never had to use it. Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> but I think you know, and I, what I want the, the reason I want you to think about this is right, it's like think back to trying to learn Spanish in class, right? What are the most difficult elements of another language to learn? Um, I would say like pronouns. Kind of like, you know how like they do like senor and then senorita. Okay. They have the same base word, but they. they well, things like, end of, like. Yeah, things like pronouns and even like grammar issues, right? What's the that? Conjugations were really hard. Yeah. Like, for us, it's just we go, you go, uh -huh. they go, and then we eat, and then like for everything. There was a different word. They didn't have just like a we. Sure. Or a, it's like, the name uh, was, or Vomino's uh -huh. or Como. But I, 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 I think you are kind of speaking to something about English that comes up in the essay, like yes right? Yes and no. Yeah, that we have a lot of general right. application words right. We're in not English, specific. right? Um, whereas a lot of other languages have words that are applicable in particular circumstances, right? right? And I think that this often leads to some misunderstandings. Um, but I think, like, like um, if you're taking language classes, right, you know, like, once you learn the rules of a particular language, right, it's easy to fit things into those rules comparatively. But when you start to get to things like idioms and metaphors, right, things that are specific to a particular language, then you're trying to understand not just a different system of speech, but a different cultural logic, right? And so, metaphors are often difficult to grasp for outsiders, even if you're otherwise fluent in the language, because you aren't steeped in the culture, right? Yeah, like if I like, told you to go break a leg, you get what I'm saying, like, okay, go break a leg. Well, I yeah. know what I want to do that. Whereas, yeah, if you, yeah, like, if, you, if you said that, like, to a German speaker, right, they would be like, why, why do you want me to break my leg? Yeah, this, is, this, <laughs> this seems unusually cruel. <laughs> do you wish me harm? <laughs> but, yeah, like, yeah like, like, a lot of our idioms and metaphors don't make sense in other linguistic contexts, right? Just as metaphors from other languages do not make sense to us, right? Like, we don't get the whole bean cake thing, right? Not because we don't get that it's a dessert. We understand that. We understand it's food, right? But we don't understand that what it really is a metaphor here for is selfish behavior, right? That the important thing is not that she ate the bean cake, it's that she ate it all by, she ate it herself, right? Thus, she did something selfish that affected the rest of the family, right? Yeah. And I think like, much of what's going on in this essay has to do with these kinds of cultural disconnects, right? Mm -hmm. So let's go to the beginning. Can I get a volunteer to read the first little uh, anecdote for us on page 159 about the family dinner in San Francisco? At a recent family dinner in San Francisco, my mother whispered to me, Sao Sao, which is brother's wife, mm -hmm. pretends to be, pretends too hard to be polite. Why bother? In the end, she always takes everything. My mother thinks like a YCO, mm -hmm. an expatriate temporarily away from China since 1949, no longer patient with ritual courtesies. As if to prove her point, she reached across the table to offer my elderly aunt from Beijing the last scallop from the Happy Family Seafood Dish. Sao Sao scowled. <sighs> It's okay, you don't have to try to read the Chinese. Okay. I don't want it. I, really, I don't, she cried, patting her plump stomach. Take it, take it, scolded my mother in Chinese. Full, I'm full, I'm full, I'm already full, Sao Sao protested weakly, eyeing the beloved scallop. I claimed my mother completely exasperated. Nobody else wants it. If you don't take it, it will only rot. 
At this point, Sao Sao sighed, acting as if she were doing my mother a big favor by taking the wretched strap off her hands. My mother turned to her brother, a high-ranking communist official who was visiting her in California for the first time. In America, a Chinese person could starve to death. If you say you don't want it, they won't ask you again forever. My uncle, no my uncle nodded and he said he understood fully. Americans take things quickly because they have no time to be polite. So here's what I want to ask you first, right? Do the mother and the brother here and her brother actually understand each other fully? Or are they talking past one another? I don't think they do. I don't think they understand each other. Completely. Okay, why not, Rylan? Um, the brother, he, he... He, you know, he's more about, like, the Americans. We don't... You know, we don't have time to be polite as this, I don't know. And then what she said, like, they only ask once, that like we only ask once. Uh-huh. It just, I don't know, it just seems different. I can't, I don't know if I have an explanation of why it's okay. different. I just, I can tell it's different. Okay, so, so, so let's try to go through the anecdote then and see how we can figure out where this disconnect is happening, right? Mm -hmm. So let's first look at what the mother whispers to the narrator here, right? What does she say to her daughter? At the very beginning of this, that also tries to be tries too hard to be polite. Does she try too hard to be polite? What's the specific word? Pretend. pretend. She pretends too hard to be polite, right? Yeah, that word matters. What does it mean to pretend? To fake it. Yeah, exactly. If you're pretending, it's fake, right? Okay, I when I, when I was reading this. I kind of got confused. So is Salsa the elderly aunt? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Salsa is the the elderly aunt. Right? Okay. Yeah. So you, yeah, yeah, Salsa is a, is a it, it's a Chinese word for sister-in-law. Which is her brother's yeah okay. Yeah yeah, Salsa yeah is her brother's wife yeah okay. And then <clears throat> let's follow on here to what she says about her mother right. My mother thinks like an expatriate, temporarily away from China since 1949. Now, when is this essay written? 1990. Yeah, so at this point then, how long has her mother been away, temporarily away from China? 51 years. What's that? 51 years. Yeah, 41 years, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 40 Yeah. Well, I'm done So... You know, once you've been away from some place for 49 years, right, you're no longer temporarily away, right? So, yeah, so, so, there's a, so the mother here is being treated with a level of irony, right? But the point she's trying to make here is this distance in time between her mother and the culture in which she was born, right? That she's been away from China for, for over 40 years, right? At this point, more than half of her life. And <clears throat> there's another uh, little irony in the paragraph as well. What's the, what's the dish that they're eating? Happy family. Happy family, yeah. The dish they're eating is called Happy Family. Do, do any of you know what Happy Family is? No. If you order Happy Family in a Chinese restaurant? Mm -hmm. So basically, Happy Family is every protein that the restaurant serves in a single dish uh, with a bunch of vegetables and sauce served over rice, right? So, you know, it's usually shrimp, scallops, beef, chicken, pork, all together on one plate. It's also a Chinese-American dish. It's not something people actually eat in China. So even like, you know, the dish that they're eating is a kind of cultural hybrid, right? It makes sense for like that to be an English one. It's like, yeah, let's just take all your protein and put it on one plate. Sure. That well, I, like I, something American. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I, 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 I think, I think the, the original idea, the original idea behind it is to not waste things, right? right. It's like, okay, this is what I've got in the pantry, <laughs> so let's just cook all of it together, right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah. The, 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 this this was something in particular that uh, Chinese immigrants in the late 19th and early 20th centuries tended to make, um, and it's just kind of survived now in Chinese restaurants, right? Um, but yeah, so even though, like the happy family dish is what the family is fighting over, right? And then, how do you guys interpret Cao Cao's behavior? Why does she refuse the scallop twice and then take it? Um, she is kind of a guest at that house. I mean, yeah. I know when like someone offers me like the last of it and I'm the guest there, I'm like, mm -hmm. no, 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 like I'm fine, I'm good, I'm already full. Yeah. And even if I think you she's actually trying to be polite. Yeah, even if you actually do want it. Yes. Right. <laughs> uh huh. I get too well, and, scared to say it. And, 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 and I think like part of what is being expressed here is that in some East Asian cultures, this is actually part of a code of behavior, right? This isn't just something you like. Politeness is something that is expected, right? And this kind of behavior is polite. When you are offered something you are supposed to refuse it twice before you accept it, right? And if the mother was still, you know, more deeply enmeshed in Chinese culture, right, then she would be going along with it. But because she's been in America for 40 years, this is pissing her off now, right? <laughs> and so she's regarding it as fake. Even though for her sister-in-law and her brother, right, this is what it means to be polite. Right? To be polite is to observe these little ritual courtesies, however inconvenient they might be, right? So it's clear that they don't understand each other, right? right. That there is a disconnect here between members of this family. Okay, yeah, no, I understand. And yeah, and a lot of it is yeah, this is the different definition of politeness, right? I mean, it's like, you know, you remember, you know, the example um, I gave you early in, the early in the semester, right? You know, it's like where, um, where I come from, it's impolite to waste somebody's time, right? So it's generally impolite to stop a stranger on the street and start asking a bunch of questions. <laughs> but here, if you don't stop to talk to someone who wants to talk to you on the street, right? That's impolite, right? So even within what's broadly the same cultural milieu, right? We're all Americans. But a Northeastern American has a slightly different standard of politeness from a Southeastern American, right? So, <clears throat> let's take this down into uh, her main complaint in the essay, right? What is the main thing that she's troubled by in this essay? What's the thing that's bothering her? I would say, uh, I wrote right here, uh, <clears throat> that the Chinese language is kind of perceived as to be like, passive and like not very like mm -hmm. kind of like pushovers almost like yeah you know like they just think that, that we don't want any conflict we're not confrontational we just want to be this little uh that's what the name of uh -huh. it, you know the language of excretion and said yeah that she doesn't want to be perceived that way because that's not what it is but the fact that people think that is because mm -hmm. they see it from an american perspective not a chinese perspective so and well, let's let's think about for a second what the word discretion means right what is discretion Covert. Okay, to be discreet. Yes, yeah. thank you, Grace. <laughs> okay. Like covert, secretive. Uh, yeah. Not under the radar. Yeah. Secretive, under the radar, and if you are discreet, why are you like? What is the point of being discreet? Like, if we're talking specifically about discretion, like that particular type of secrecy. What kind of secrecy is it? Like avoiding standing out or being like. Hmm. Yeah, it, it's. Avoiding mm -hmm. like almost something that would 
require you to be confronted about it. Yeah, it's a lot of it is about conflict avoidance, right? Conflict. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the one I was looking yeah. for. Would that be like keeping your comments to yourself? Like if something's like kind of bugging you and you're like, let me just keep that to myself. Yeah. So th this is kind of like, like the thing that Audre Lorde compared to cancer, right? <laughs> Just keeping your mouth shut to avoid conflict, right? Yeah. But yeah, so the language of discretion, right, is a kind of language of conflict avoidance. And what is she saying people cite as evidence? The fact that they don't have a word for yes or no. Yeah, now is this actually true? No, not necessarily, but it's not like a, a direct, like, word-to-word -word translation. Um, yeah, this, this kind of fits into what we were talking about a moment ago, right? right. We talk about, you know, <clears throat> situational modifiers in languages, right? So we have these general words, yes and no, that apply to virtually all situations, right? Let's go to, I think it's on page 164, when she explains to you exactly have, how a Chinese person says yes and no. They have like yes or no to like, that goes with the situation, that goes with the conversation, I guess. Yeah. Where we could just say yes or no, but we have to add other words to explain what yes or what no. Right. Whereas, yeah, the, the Chinese word actually saves time and explanation, right? It's actually more efficient than our yes or no and more clear than our yes or no, right? So how does one say yes or no in Chinese, ask my friends a bit literally. And here I do agree in part with the New York Times Magazine article. There is no one word for yes or no, but not out of necessity to be discreet. If anything, I would say the Chinese equivalent of answering yes or no is discreet, that is specific to what is asked, right? So she's playing out here actually with a kind of ambiguity in meaning in terms of the word, right? That discreet can actually mean two separate things. It can mean secretive, it can mean, you know, conflict avoiding, but it can also mean specific. Ask a Chinese person if he or she has eaten, and he or she might say, eaten already, or perhaps have not. Ask, so, hey, so you had insurance at the time of the accident, the response would be correct, or did not have. Ask, have you stopped beating your wife, and the answer refers directly to the proposition being asserted or denied. Stopped already, still have not, never beat, have no wife. What could be clearer? <laughs> right? So the point here being is, yeah, the, you know, the Chinese for yes or no depends on the question you were asked, right? Let's think about the implications of that a little bit as well. If the correct response depends on the question you were asked, what does that say about the nature of communication in this particular language? Do you need to perhaps listen more closely in order yeah. to communicate effectively? And she brought that up. She was talking about a uh you know, like getting like phone calls, uh, you know, like about like being like a lucky winner of one of these five prizes. Sure. Uh, prizes. But she was like, why do like maybe that's perhaps like why she like listens so closely to it. Uh huh. To listen. Right. right. Exactly what's being said specifically to a draw. Yeah. Like an answer for it. But the thing we don't want to fall into here, right? The, the trap we don't want to fall into is to start thinking in this kind of. Um, what do we want to, how do I want to put this? The, the, this kind of um, amateur linguist application of the Saper Whorf hypothesis. Now, had any of you guys heard of this idea before reading this essay, the Saper Whorf hypothesis? Yes. Is this at all familiar to anyone? It was not. Okay. Were you able to figure out what it means from context here, from the way she explains it? Okay, so what is the Saper Whorf hypothesis? Uh, it, the idea that the one's language creates the reality around them is what I wrote down, kind of like. Uh huh. 
if you don't have words for certain things and that doesn't really become part of your reality or like yeah, essentially what it refer what it means yeah, is that language, right, your language shapes your perception of an interaction with the world. So say a culture that has a dozen different words for snow is going to have a richer and more varied experience of snow than a culture that only has one word for it, right? And uh, by the way, like the assertions that uh, certain um, Canadian and Arctic Circle dwelling um, indigenous peoples have dozens of different worlds of words for snow, right? It is, that's actually bullshit, right? It's not actually true. But it's something that's often cited in defense of the Saper Wolf hypothesis, right? That their experience of snow is somehow different because their vocabulary for it is different. Now, what is the risk we run if we apply this too rigorously to any language and its speakers? What does this turn language into? And I think. I want to look at another part of her essay, the part where she's specifically talking about the New York Times article, and I think that'll give us an answer to this. Can I get somebody to start reading on page 159 uh, from, I thought about this misunderstanding again. I thought about this misunderstanding again of social context, failing and translation. When a friend sent me an article from the New York Times Magazine, April 24th, 1988, the article on changes in New York Chinatown made passing reference to the inherent ambivalence of the Chinese language. Chinese people are so discreet and modest, the article stated. There aren't even words for yes and no. That's not true, I thought, although I can see why an outsider might think that. I continued reading. If one is Chinese, the article went on to say, one compromises, one does has a, a loss of faith by an over-emphatic response. My throat seized. Why do people keep saying these things as if we truly were the, those little dolls sold in Chinatown tourist shops, heads bobbing up and down in complacent agreement to anything said? I worry about the effect of one-dimensional statements on the unwary and godless when they read about this so-called vocabulary deficit but they also conclude that Chinese people evolved into a mild-mannered lot because the language only allowed them to hobble forth with mince words. Something enormous is always lost in translation. Something insidious seeps into the gap, especially when amateur linguists continue to compare one-for-one -one language differences and then put forth notions wide open to mis misinterpretation that Chinese people have no direct linguistic means to make decisions assert or deny, affirm or negate, just say no to drug dealers, or behave properly on the witness stand when told, please answer yes or no. Okay, thank you. So, uh, I picked out a couple of key words here that are related to the Saper Wharf hypothesis and the way she's conceiving of it um, in this essay, right? So first off, what is ambivalence? What does it mean if something is ambivalent? Pardon? Is it unclear? Like... Yeah, unclear or ambiguous, right? Ambivalent literally means kind of like shifting back and forth quickly between two poles, right? So ambivalent, yeah, means something like ambiguous or, or as you put it, unclear. And what does it mean if something is inherent? If, if, if something is an inherent characteristic? Like it was passed down. Yeah, almost okay. like inherited, right? Something that's inherent is something that is naturally part of something, right? So what is this writer in this New York Times article suggesting about Chinese language here? And it's like naturally passive, naturally, I guess naturally non or it's naturally computational. But I think the point, what, like, what you were getting at earlier is that if you with the hypothesis is that it, like it could cause you to have like an inaccurate perception of the culture. Of the whole culture, yeah, sure. Yeah. But I think it's the kind of perception that we're trying to get at here and I want to try to pull out of all of this um, stuff. So yeah, essentially 
what she's saying here, this amateur linguist writing this article, is this person just a journalist, they're not a linguist. Um, they're saying that, un, that you know, a lack of clarity and ambiguity are kind of naturally baked into the Chinese language, right? That's a natural part of it. Chinese people are so discreet and modest, the article stated, there aren't even words for yes and no. So we talked a little bit about what discreet means, kind of secretive, right? Um, conflict avoiding. What does it mean to be modest? In this context. So say, you, like, you know, say you've just won an award and you're trying to downplay it, right? You know, it's, oh, it's nothing, right? You know, and, and somebody says to you, oh, don't be modest. So it's like humble or like, like what she said? Yeah, so somebody who's modest is humble and self-effacing, right? Doesn't assert themselves too much. Yeah, so to be modest is to be self-effacing. So someone who is discreet and modest is essentially someone who is passive, right? Now, we'll sit on outsider, insider, and unwary and guileless for a second. There are other passages I want to try to connect that to. But when she uses this metaphor here, right, my throat seized. Why do, peop why do people keep saying these things? As if we truly were those little dolls sold in Chinatown, uh, sold in tour Chinatown tourist shops, heads bobbing up and down in complacent agreement to anything said. So, what is she saying? This article is comparing Chinese people to. Like those dolls, like China dolls. Yeah, to dolls. dolls. What what kind of dolls specifically? Um, like porcelain. Bobblehead dolls. Yeah. I think that, yeah, the, the tourist shop element of this is also important. We'll pull that out in a second. But yeah, she's saying that, you know, people who, people who like the writer of this article think of us like bobblehead dolls, right? And let's start with the bobblehead part of this, right? What is a bobblehead doll? Like, what does it do? It just nods sometimes. Yeah, it's just, the, it, it, it's, it's, it's a doll with a little body and a giant head that's loosely attached, right? and it just nods all the time, right? Can it do anything other than nod on its own power? No. <laughs> yeah, even if, if you want it to shake its head no, you have to actually put your hand on it and do that, right? Whereas if you just leave it alone, it'll keep nodding. Right? It just works by force of gravity. So what, why is this a fit metaphor for the way she, for the stereotype she's talking about. Because, like, they're, like I said earlier, like, they, she thinks that they just see that language as just like a passive, non confrontational language, so they're just mm -hmm. going to nod their head and, like, constant agreement. Like, yeah. They're not going to confront you or try to go against opposing you. Yeah, that all they're able to do, because of their language, which is discreet and modest, is agree with you, right? No, like you said, it's not only you have a like a one-sided view of their language, but a whole culture of people. Yeah, you're applying a misunderstanding about language, right? To cause you to read a whole culture in terms of passivity and lack of agency, right? Mm -hmm. That all these people can do because they have no specific word for yes or no, is bob their heads up and down in agreement all the time, right? That they're always compliant, always in agreement, and they can't do otherwise. And this is where we get like to the, the idea of being hobbled here and of language as a deficit, right? So if I say that like you have a deficit in your vocabulary, what do I mean by that? Yeah, a deficit is a lack, right? Oh. 
Yeah, no, no, you're, 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 you're absolutely right, right? Oh, okay. So, you know, if, yeah, if I say you have a deficit in your vocabulary, right, I'm, what I'm telling you is, like, you need to learn more fucking words, right? <laughs> But yeah, what she's what she's saying here is that people like this writer see Chinese language in terms of deficit, in terms of lack, right? And see Chinese people as thus being hobbled by their language. Now what does it mean to be hobbled? If you're hobbling like, around, what does that mean? Be like impaired. Yeah. Somebody who's hobbling is limping, right? Is impaired, can't walk properly. So the argument that she's trying to make here is to sort of put these things together, right? Is that the Saper-Whorf hypothesis views language as being like an inherited disability that affects a whole culture, right? And this is why she wants to reject this hypothesis. Because she believes that it paints her culture in particular in terms of lack, right? In terms of weakness and passivity and inferiority. Does this make sense so far? Everybody with me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now let's deal with the, some of these other terms here as well. She talks about the unwary and the guileless and notes that bobblehead, these, the bobblehead dolls are sold in tourist shops. I want to turn to a passage near the end of the essay page 164. Can I get somebody to read the paragraph that starts with, it makes me wonder though, and just follow until the uh, space that separates uh, this from the next section. It makes me wonder though Thank you, how many, how do you say that word, anthropologists? Uh-huh. How many sociologists, how many travel journalists have documented so-called natural interactions? foreign land, all of those with the spiral notebooks in the app. How many other cases are, how many cases that are of long lost primitive, primitive. primitive tribe, people who turn, turned out to be so sophisticated enough to put, uh, put on the same age show the Stone Age show that anthropologists, um, ethnologists, people who study ethnicity. Yep. Oh, my bad. That's okay. Have come, have come to see. And how many tourists fresh off the bus have wandered into Chinese town expected to, expecting the self and self effacing. Yep. Okay. Shopkeeper to admit under that the goods are not worth the price they have. I have witnessed it. I do not know the doors. I do not know the doors that the shopkeeper. Uh, Cantonese. Cantonese woman in her 50s. I don't, it doesn't look genuine to me. I'll give you $3 for it. You don't like the price? Go somewhere else. The shopkeeper. You're not a nice person for the pride of the shop tourist. Not a nice person at all. Who said I have to be nice? Not the shopkeeper. Okay, so let's start, because I think it's a little simpler here, with a little story about the tourist, right? What kinds of ideas do we associate with tourists generally? What do we think of when we say tourists? Annoying. Uh, okay. <laughs> Annoying. <laughs> Sucker. Annoying sucker. Outsider. Uh, Outsider. Yes. yes. <laughs> A tourist is by definition someone who isn't from here, right? A tourist is by definition a visitor or an outsider, right? Good. Now, why do we tend to think of these kinds of outsiders, these kinds of visitors, as annoying? Like, apart from their, ter their usually terrible fashion sense, <laughs> the fanny packs and the shorts with the socks pulled up to their knees. And all that. <laughs> <laughs> the, the universal white American on vacation uniform. <laughs> I feel like I lived in, before I moved here, I lived in 
Cocoa Beach, Florida. So, so like you, right you, saw, so you so saw a lot of this I shit. I was, yeah. like, my life was fluctuating with tourists. Okay. But um, <laughs> it was just very annoying because, like, everyone that lived there, uh-huh. and it sounds snobby, but it's really not. Like, yeah. everyone that lived there, we all kind of just had a groove, and we knew which way to go and which way to drive and where yeah. the cops were and, like, just what not to do yeah. and they all kind of just came in and would like park on the side of the highway for a launch and you're not supposed to do that right and like just like they we had a system and they didn't know what it was and they yeah. got in the way so it's almost like they're not in tune with like your customs like exactly yeah, yeah I, I could i can actually i can give you a similar example right when i was in my early 20s um when i was just out of college i lived in new york city for a couple years i worked at a publishing company at rockefeller center and most days I would go to the same deli for a sandwich for lunch, right? I just, you know, I'd go buy my, buy my sandwich and go back to my desk and eat it. Um, so around Christmas, Rockefeller Center, like that whole area gets bombarded with, you know, people with just like getting off of buses with matching ugly Christmas sweaters and mustaches and, you know, so on and so forth, right? Coming from various parts of the country. Um, and, you know, they would just, like, start wandering into places. Like, you know, they would wander into, like, this one time a bunch of them just wandered into my, you know, daily lunchtime deli. And they're just, they're walking around. They just, they, they walk right up to the counter. They start shouting out orders. And, you know, I said to uh, a guy who literally just cut in front of me in the queue, it was just like, you know, hey, uh, the line ends behind me. And he just looked at his friend and said, oh, New Yorkers are so rude. Nobody helps you out. It's like, what did I just do? <laughs> You're in my way. Right? I live here. <laughs> I feel like you definitely could have been a lot ruder about yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> I was. I was perfectly polite, right? Yeah. But yeah, it's like a you know, stereotype. We, yeah, exactly. We, we think of tourists as rude or annoying because they often don't bother to obey the rules of where they are. Right. right? You know, the, at least our stereotype of a tourist is someone who treats the world like their living room. <laughs> so, when we're talking about a tourist here, we're talking about someone who's by definition an outsider, and what does he seem to expect in this exchange with the shopkeeper? Some kind of deal, apparently. He's saying it doesn't look uh-huh. real, I'll give you this much more. Yeah. It's like some kind of leniency. Some kind and, of- and why would he think that would work? Because they're Chinese. Yeah, because his stereotype of a Cantonese woman in her 50s, right, is that this is a person who is just going to roll over when I suggest that her her goods look fake, right? And she surprises him by saying, you you don't like my price, go somewhere else, right? And then, you know, what what does he then call her? What does he say about her? You're not very nice. You're not nice, right? Not a nice person. Yeah. So because she won't accommodate him, right? because she won't fit into his model of reality, or what reality ought to be, she's not nice. So what happens here is this, you know, tourist who's out of his own context and assuming that every place is like home, right? He's trying to assert himself with someone he thinks is going to be modest. And he's upset, he's angry, when the world doesn't conform to his opinions, right? When the world doesn't give him what he wants. Now, how is this then related to the example above this about the ethnologists and anthropologists and sociologists? Now, if we're talking about various people with ologist after their name, what does that suggest to us about them? They're, like they're smart. They're, they're an expert on this on yeah. The yeah. topic. These are, yeah, these are educated people, right? These are educated professionals with expertise in this particular subject, right? And yet, what is Tan saying happens to these people when they go to supposedly primitive places? Are they able to honestly engage with and understand what it is that they see? No, 
because well, like they're stuck with the <clears throat> with their perception of it. So. Yeah, because they're assuming right. what the people they're observing should be behaving like, right? The people they're observing will put on the show they want, right? Either to get attention or to get these people to leave them alone. Right? So tourists and experts are alike in this, right? In that they're both outsiders and that they both have naive expectations about other cultures. Right? That to be an outsider is always to be someone who doesn't really understand what's going on. Who can't really fully engage with the culture. I guess that's why she put like the quotations around natural interactions. Yeah. Yeah, the scare quotes around natural, right? You know, demonstrate there's nothing, there's nothing genuinely natural about these interactions, right? On the one hand, you know, one person supposedly has the power and the education and the authority, right? But the other group can subvert that power and subvert that authority by making these professionals look foolish, right? right. In fact, like there have been several instances in the history of anthropology where supposedly, you know, primitive tribes, um, once the cameras are off and once the scientists have gone home, are, you know, you know, going back to bungalows and cracking open a coke, right? <laughs> <It's, Yeah. laughs> they're giving, the, they're, you know, they, they give the people what they want to see, and then they go home. There, are, there have also been cases in which, like, the ethnologists have specifically engineered these kinds of things. You know, they pay people um, in the tribes that are observing to engage in certain behaviors, right? So that they can then document it and write a book about it and get tenure. So, where are we for time? Since I have no clock and I can't exactly tell by the sun. It's 2.47. 2.47, okay, so we got a little time. All right, so let's focus on the way she ends this. And try to compare that to the story she told at the beginning, right? So can I get somebody to start reading at the top of page 165. Are you hungry? I asked in Thank Chinese. Grace. Not hungry, said my uncle promptly. The same response he once gave me 10 minutes before he suffered a low blood sugar attack. Not too hungry, said my aunt. Perhaps you're hungry? A little, I admitted. We can eat, we can eat, they both consented. What kind of food, I asked. Oh, doesn't matter, anything will do. Nothing fancy, just some simple food is fine. Do you like Japanese food? We haven't had that yet, I suggested. They looked at each other. We can eat it, said my uncle bravely, the survivor of the long march. We have eaten it before, added my aunt. Raw fish. Oh, you don't like it, I said. Don't be polite. We can go somewhere else. We are not being polite. We can eat it, my aunt insisted. So I drove them to Japantown, and we walked past several restaurants featuring colorful plastic displays of sushi. Not this one. Not this one either, I continued to say, as if searching for a Japanese restaurant similar to the last. Here it is, I finally said, turning into a restaurant famous for its Chinese fish dishes from Shandong. Shandong? Shandong? Mm -hmm. Oh, Chinese food, cried my aunt, obviously relieved. My uncle patted my arm. You think Chinese? It's your last night here in America, I said, so don't be polite. Act like an American. And that night, we ate a banquet. So how is this anecdote different from the anecdote at the beginning of the essay. She's telling them to act like Americans, right? right? Is she acting like an American in this? I mean, for what I think for what they mean by that, she's trying to be polite. She's trying to do what they want to do, though it's uh -huh. you know, so she's not, I guess, by their definition of what acting American is. Like. 
Well, and I, I think the you know, you know her uncle tells her, "You think Chinese, right?" Yeah. What does he mean by this? What does he mean when he tells her that she thinks Chinese? What has happened in this exchange between them? She do what they they consider being polite, like the mod. Yeah, like the being polite. You know, was like asking two times, and you uh -huh. know, more than one time, especially because they're guests. Yeah. Labeling, I think the labeling the cultures or I guess the languages with like certain behavioral cult like codes like this is how Chinese people would behave this way in a polite manner or whatever or going by their rituals I guess well, or whatever. yeah uh, what, what, what were you can you uh, what, what, what were you saying there can you uh, complete that thought I forgot <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> you're fine okay. I just forgot what I said completely but um what did I say? Uh, well, let's let's think about what the process is here. Right? What does she ask them first? Are you hungry? Are you hungry? And how do they respond? Not hungry. Not hungry. Not too hungry. Perhaps you're hungry, right? Is that they trying to they trying to like keep her in the power seat? I guess. Like she, you know, they don't want to seem like they're being too needy or greedy. Yeah, but they are also then clearly indicating that, yeah, we're hungry, right? Yeah. Yeah. But perhaps you're asking us because you're hungry, right? We don't want you to go out to eat just because we're hungry, right? But they don't want to feel better. Yeah. In a way. This is a little, I admitted. We can eat. We can eat. <laughs> and then what? And then what does she suggest to them? Japanese food. Yeah. And do they indicate pretty clearly how they feel about that suggestion? <laughs> I mean, they, they take a look at each other. And I can only imagine the look that they get each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Then... We, we don't care for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's like, we, we can eat it, said my uncle bravely. Raw fish. <laughs> raw fish. Yeah, we have eaten it before, raw fish, right? We're not being polite, we can eat it, right? Mm -hmm. So, we can eat it clearly means like, we, we'll put up with it if yeah. that's what you want, right? So they're trying not to be pushy in telling her that they want Chinese food, right? While at the same time, letting her know not really all that subtly that they really don't want Japanese food, right? And does she interpret these cultural codes correctly? Yeah. Yeah, she avoids embarrassing them by going and looking at a bunch of Japanese restaurants first, right? Mm -hmm. And then taking them where she knows they actually want to go, right? So the point is here that everybody in this exchange actually understands fully what's going on, right? So while this might seem convoluted to an outsider, to somebody who understands the language and the cultural codes associated with it, the conversation is perfectly clear. Like, everybody knows what everybody else means. They know what she means and she knows what they mean. And so, you know, instead of fighting over the happy family, the last bite's a happy family, right? They eat a banquet, right? Everything's great. Now, I do want to say one more thing about the insider-outsider thing, and then we'll kind of let it go. And you can, you know, go your merry way and enjoy your weekends. To what extent does Tan seem to view herself as an insider or an outsider within Chinese and American cultures, as a bilingual, bicultural person? Well, uh, she's, her, both of her parents were immigrants, right? Both of them were immigrants from mainland China, so uh -huh. she would be an insider in a way with Chinese culture, but also an sure. outsider because she is, like, was she born in America? I'm, I'm not mm -hmm. really sure. So, yeah, okay, so I'm, like, I'm, yeah I'm fairly certain she was born in the United States. American, but her parents are not. So she's yeah. kind of an insider because she uh -huh. was born here, but an outsider because she's of Chinese descent. And sure. vice versa. And she does note places at which those two identities are in conflict with each other. Right? Look at home. Go ahead. I say at home, there's yeah. conflict because you know her mom 
you know, they, they feed her in Chinese and English, and she only responds back in English. Uh-huh. Yeah. They mentioned that, like, a lot of her works are, like, done with that, like, a conflict between the Chinese mother and the American daughter. And right. Like, the language barrier or the conflict of characteristics. And when she's talking about how she deals with people on the phone, right? Right. Um, you know, <laughs> she feels kind of caught between both linguistic and cultural worlds. Right? On the one hand, she feels this need to hear people out. But on the other hand, like when people, you know, keep pressing her to, you know, come look at a timeshare or whatever, right? You know, she loses patience and gets annoyed. You know, I want to note, and you know, we'll, we'll leave it here, just this uh, as a last thing here as well. You know, when she is exchanging letters with her nephew in Shanghai, right? She says, I am evidently one of the outsiders. My nephew in Shanghai, who recently started taking English lessons, has been writing me letters in English. I had told him I was a fiction writer. And so in one letter he wrote, congratulate to you on your writing. Perhaps one day I should like to read it. I took it in the same vein as perhaps one day we can get together for lunch. I sent back a cheery note. A month went by, and another letter arrived from Shanghai. Last one, perhaps, I hadn't writing distinctly, he said. In the future, you'll send a copy of your works for me. Right? So right. she takes as a kind of polite pleasantry her nephew's statement that he wants to read her books, right? Right. Like, I don't want to meet up and talk about it. I just want to read yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, he, he, exactly. Yeah, he, he, he actually wants to read the books, right? So this insider-outsider dichotomy is also related to this literal versus figurative binary, right? That we started talking about at the beginning of class. And to be an outsider is to keep confusing the two, right? To be an outsider is never to be quite clear which is which and which applies in a given situation. All right, so that is all I've got for you guys today. Does anybody have any questions or comments or anything you want to say? I enjoyed being outside. Didn't we all? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I specifically asked for this uh, board to be bought with department funds last semester so we could take people outside and raise it. Um, and uh, yeah, yesterday they put it together for me. So. <laughs> All right, uh, so everybody have yourselves a good weekend. And we'll see you Tuesday. Okay.